Thank you, God. Charlie, sit down. <laughs> oh. I'm telling you. He'll even upstate your mom. I'm telling you, that's something. Hey, and also, our uh, great appreciation to, to both Nathan and Larry. Nathan and Larry were on point about the, the breakfast today, and it was a marvelous Mom's Day breakfast. I know the Harry Charles brought in flowers and fruit for it, and we had a, a great crew of men who helped to prepare it and serve it. So our, our thanks to all of them, and moms, moms, I hope you enjoyed that breakfast. I know you did. All right. Um, in addition to being Mother's Day, this is also the, the night or the day of the Palisade High School Baccalaureate. And we have two graduates in that group, Jenny and Joe. And uh, we invite you to come and be in on that with them and celebrate that tonight. And the commencement is tomorrow at Stoker Stadium. Jenny, what time is it tomorrow? 6.30, 6 .30 tomorrow at Stoker Stadium. What, what kind of weather are we supposed to have tomorrow? It's going to be sunny, and it better be. Okay, all right, good deal. All right. A baccalaureate is a special, uh, a special recognition that is more focused on a faith angle. It's more of a faith angle in recognition of graduates. So in, I think in the Palisade High School group usually has, it's, there's, we have a special speaker at that gathering that's usually a clergy person. And I believe it's going to be the pastor of the Palisade Christian Church, Jim Peterman. Tonight will be the speaker. And then, of course, some of the students will present special uh, talents that they have at it. So that's at the Palisade High School Auditorium tonight, and that begins at 5 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Sharp Circle meets Tuesday. Where are you meeting, Sharp Circle? At the church building. Here at the church building, 7 o'clock Tuesday. And let's see, let's see, there's a quilting going on. And also, I see, you can see that we're starting to print information about our church camps. You realize we're only about a month away from our first church camp. It's coming right up on us. So we want to encourage you to pay attention to that information to make sure you register your students, especially the middle high camp is the first camp that starts, and that's in the middle of June. So we want to encourage you to get that registration in. Remember what we do in our congregation. Our congregation pays a scholarship for every one of our students, 50% of the cost for our kids to go to camp. Now what we ask you to do, and parents to do, is to come up with your registration early so that we can get it at the more agreeable rate. Right? The earlier you register, the more agreeable the rate. So if you would help us in that direction, we'd sure appreciate that. And uh, let's see, uh, remember that on Saturday, May 23rd, there is a wedding going on involving Charles and Julia up at the Colorado Cellars, and, we, and our congregation is invited to be in on that as well. Am I forgetting anything? Go ahead, Harry Charles. I, I wanted to emphasize the work camp that takes a lot of work to open the camp. You have to open the buildings and, and summarize them, and you have to get the boats down in the water. And I believe the opening of the camp is the 30th and the 6th, right? Uh, May 30th and June 6th. Those are the two camp opening days. So if you can help us to get the camps open, get the snow off of everything, get the heaters working, getting everything fixed and back and in good repair, we'd appreciate it. <coughs> All right, thank you. All right, well, we're here to worship the Lord. We're going to start off by singing kind of an old hymn song from 1 Timothy 3.16. It's called, And Without Controversy, Great is the Mystery of Godliness. So would you please stand, and let's worship the Lord together as we sing it. Pat, welcome to you, man. Glad you're joining us today.
Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's the basic gospel. Hi, Brianna. Good to see you. Uh, congratulations on your graduation as well. Yes. The class of 2015. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Trevor. You guys behave yourselves. Okay. <laughs> hey, there's a camp. It's a camp song, right? It's a camp yeah. song. It talks about Jesus meeting three different people out there in his ministry, his public ministry. He met a blind guy, he met a woman at the well, and he met a beggar by the side of the road in Jericho. And he said uh, to them basically what he says to us now, I am the way and the truth and the life, <coughs> and no one comes to the Father except through me. All right. Hi, Joy. Welcome back to you. You're, we're glad that you're here with us again today. All right, let's sing it. Praise to the Lord. All right. Go ahead and start your drums, Judy. That's all right. Now, we've thrown a curve at Judy because Charlene is off um, in support of Randy's family. Randy's dad passed on down in Texas, and Charlene is down there, and we're missing her and praying for her to travel safely. So we've thrown a curve at Judy asking her to cover that particular base. So what do you think? You got it? Maybe. What's the number? Well, I got the right number. I was on A instead of B. Oh, okay then. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Fine man stood by the road and he cried. Flying. 
<laughs> hey, uh, have a seat, everybody. Let's sit down and sing this next song. It's a pretty song, and it's a song of devotion. It reminds us how important the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is in our thinking and in our worship. Always be mindful of the cross. We don't, we don't put Jesus on the cross. Jesus is no longer on the cross. He's already made his sacrifice. But the cross reminds us of the sacrifice and the, the, perfect, um, the perfect Christ and his shed blood for us that washes our sins away. So Jesus, always keep me near to the cross and always mindful of it. We'll sing first, the second, and the fourth verses. Chris, thank you.
Aren't we grateful that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? And he's the Savior of all kinds of people, including our wonderful moms. Uh, isn't it a joy to know that God gives the gift of eternal life to our moms through him? Praise you, Lord. Thank you for that. So we're going to sing a little song about moms. It's called... Uh, we actually appropriated the words a little bit from a Faith of Our Father's song, and now it's Faith of Our Mother's song. Okay, so we're going to do our best to sing that. We're going to start off singing that song a cappella. Okay, that's, this puts us all right on the spot. All right, here we go. Faith of Our Mother's. We'll ask the ladies to sing the second spirit that she was certainly saved. Does anybody have a little more specific on that? Sharon? Did you get that one? Okay. Okay. And Any, is it anybody talk is anybody talked with Betty in the last week? I know, you don't, you don't get a word in edgewise with her. I'm telling you, from the time you pick up to the phone or you go visit her, she's talking. She is so fired up about this, uh, this revival in her life, this new visitation from the Lord. It's yeah. kind of a blessed assurance experience <laughs> yeah. that Betty has had. You know, she went through a seizure and two strokes. And in the process there, uh, God really encountered her and gave her a new joy and a new assurance of her salvation. Thank you, God, for doing that stuff. And isn't she our 94-year-old mother? She's, no, she's 90. 90-year-old 90 yeah. mother. 90-year-old mom, and she's got some of her, her kids with her right now. All right. And Donna? I saw Donna. Where did I she go? I did, too. She's gone. She stepped out. Okay. Hey, uh, Chris. 
Chris has found something for us for our in enjoyment to watch in regard to moms. It's kind of a reverence to moms, and we're going to ask our ushers to receive our tithes and gifts as you view this special video about moms in reverence to them. And guys, why don't you dump the lights up here, uh, Kelly?
everybody has their thing about their their mom. Sorry, I'm a little bit uh, derailed. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I'm going to attempt to offer a tip that might be helpful to all the professional homemakers in the room. And even though that's not always moms, it's still mostly moms. It's an amazing, versatile, industrial strength cleaner. It is economical and biodegradable, mostly. In many states, highway patrol officers carry about two gallons of this solvent in the trunks of their cars in order to remove blood from the highways involving wildlife accidents. It is a fabulous meat tenderizer. You can actually put a T-bone steak in a bowl of this solution for about three hours and then cut it with a fork. To clean a toilet, you take about a 12 ounce can of this solvent and you pour it into your toilet bowl and you let it stand for an hour. And when you flush it, you will have the most beautiful clean porcelain you've ever seen in your life. The citric acid removes stains from vitreous china. Here's a good tip for you. To remove grease from the clothing that you put into your washing machine, add a 12 ounce can of this stuff, then pour in your detergent, and then run it through the wash cycle. You'll have the cleanest clothes you've ever seen. The active ingredient in this particular solvent or solution is phosphoric acid, which has a pH of 2.8. This will dissolve a nail in about four days. Remarkably, this solvent makes a fine brown gravy when mixed with the dripping of ham and beef. It contains about six ounces or six teaspoons of sugar in a 16 ounce bottle. And if you haven't guessed what it is, it used to be called the real thing. And you may enjoy Coca Cola, but I would encourage you just don't drink it. A little tip for all you homemakers. <laughs> please look with me at the scripture today, please. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 11. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd who is willing to die for his sheep. The King James Version says he is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. When the hired man who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees a wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. So the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hired man runs away because he is only a hired man and doesn't care about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. As the Father knows me, I know the Father. And in the same way I know my sheep, and my sheep they know me. And I am willing to lay down my life for the sheep. And there are other sheep which belong to me, which are not of this particular sheepfold or pin. I must bring them to. They will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Let's pray a minute. Praise you, Heavenly Father. You are kind and merciful, merciful beyond our imagination. Lord, I ask that you would speak to us in these few minutes concerning your 
word and your messages to us, some as moms, others who are children, others who are grandparents, whatever your messages are, God, we pray that they would come through loud and clear. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Statistics reveal to us that when people born before 1940 were young, and you know who you are, the average household that you grew up in included two parents, the biological children of those parents, and most likely a set of grandparents. For those who were born between 1940 and 1960, those baby boomers, the household of your youth was probably consi consisted of your mom and dad and children. The majority of today's of American families consists of a mom or a dad and children, or in many cases, a, a mom and a stepdad and stepchildren and children and and or the, the other way around. The most dramatic change in our society has been the advent of the single parent, and I appreciated the nod to the single parent as we saw that presented today. And the consequences of this development are worth noting. When the weight of responsibility is shifted from two parents to one, the results are very difficult, unbearable, and sometimes devastating. I want you to think for a minute of all the single parents you know. We all know them. They're in our families. They're in our circle of friends. They're our colleagues. We all know them. Think about that single parent. There was a famous circus troupe known as the Flying Walindas. Some of you might know who they are. They were great trapeze artists and acrobats, and they performed a famous stunt that nobody else has been able to match. They formed a human pyramid on a high wire, 30 feet above the ground, and after they had done it many times, they removed the net for effect. The human pyramid consisted of four men walking across a high wire, supporting three more men standing on poles mounted on the walker's shoulders, and above those three men was a woman seated in a chair. One night as the pyramid inched its way across the wire, one of the veterans in the family, his name is Dieter Walinda, felt his knee began to quiver, Brenda. And he began to lose strength in his knee. And he shouted out in the silence, I can't hold it any longer. And the entire pyramid collapsed. The family members were thrown to the ground and all of them suffered permanent career-ending injuries. The Flying Walinda. Single parents can sympathize with this man, Dieter Walinda, because they feel sometimes as if the entire weight of their family is on their shoulders, and many times it is. Well, whether you are a single parent or the parents who make their home together, the words of our Lord Jesus are particularly applicable to you today. Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And in many ways, I believe the good shepherd resembles and parallels the role of a good parent. Is it hard to be a good parent in America today? Is it hard? You bet it is. It's very hard. Notice, first of all, that the role of the good shepherd is, first of all, sacrificial. Jesus said, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. 
Anyone in this room have a mother who modeled sacrificial love for you? <laughs> Many of us do. There are very few moms who do not put the needs of their family above their own. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And at first glance, there is something rather absurd about this statement, isn't there? <laughs> because sheep are among the least intelligent creatures God ever made. So why in heaven's name would a person lay down his life for his sheep? But that's what the good shepherd does. Of course, Jesus isn't talking about sheep, is he? He's talking about us. We are his sheep. He sacrifices his life for his sheep. And good parents are called upon to do the same. When we bring up a child into this world, we have the responsibility to be there for that child regardless of what it may cost us. Like a good shepherd, the good parent is committed to love and protect that child and to nurture that child and bring them safely into adolescence and into adulthood. This does not allow for a parent to simply walk out on their child simply because it's difficult or hard or because the parent or the child is unruly. Even if we'd be much happier and it'd be much easier to be somewhere else. The role of the good shepherd and the good parent is, first of all, sacrificial. Mackenzie, I appreciated what Mike said yesterday. You see, you see motherhood through new eyes, he said. And that's the truth, isn't it? You can see some things that you didn't see before. Wow, what you two are going to be called on to sacrifice for your baby. Secondly, the attention of the good shepherd is individual. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Anybody remember that parable Jesus told us about the lost sheep? Remember, the shepherd gets his entire flock inside a pen. And when he gets in there and he counts them, he finds out he's missing one of them. So he leaves those sheep in the pen, and he goes out in search of that lost sheep. And when he finds the lost sheep, he collects it to him, he wraps it around his neck, he comes back and he rejoices. And the gospel writer says, even so, there is rejoicing over in heaven over one soul who is lost and has come back to the Lord. One of the magnificent teachings of the Bible is that God knows and cherishes, cherishes each of us as individuals. When God looks at us, in this room or it, he looks at the human humanity on the planet he doesn't see some kind of vague blob of six and a half billion people remember what louis giglio told us last week god knows every one of those 46 chromosomes that comprise us god knows every one of those three million characteristics that comprise our dna strain god knows us individually and he loves us as individuals. Moms know this. If you have more than one child, you really know this one. Let me give you an example from life about a surpassing, incredible mother. Her name is Susanna Wesley. I don't know if she's any relation to you, Shirley. I bet you she is, being the quality mother she was, right? Susanna Wesley and her husband lived in 19th century England. Together, they gave birth to 19 children. Now, I don't think that's a record, but it's above average. Sad aspect about, or sad um, fact about their life is that nine of their children died. Nine. Uh, they died of uh, diphtheria or tuberculosis or some other childhood disease. Can you imagine how Susanna went on after she buries nine of her children? But she did. She went on and she homeschooled her ten surviving children. And after she taught them, they were so well prepared 
that they were able to enroll in Oxford University, the most prestigious school in England, at the ages of 16. Every one of them at 16. One of her sons, one of the oldest in her family, is John Wesley. And John Wesley became the founder of uh, the Methodist denomination of Christians. Charles Wesley is a celebrated hymn writer. He compro composed more than 5,000 hymns. And Samuel Wesley, another brother, became a scholarly priest in the Church of England. One of their daughters, Martha, became the member of an elite literary society at Oxford, in fact, the only woman to be admitted into that society in her generation. Now, after John, remember, he's one of the oldest sons, after John left home, his mother wrote him a letter. And in the letter, she's describing her strategy at how she takes care of the younger children. You know, she has two or three generations of children. How does she take care of them? This is what she wrote in her letter, quote, I take as much time as I can spare every night to talk to each child. On Monday, I talk to Molly. On Tuesday, to Hetty. On Wednesday, Nancy. On Thursday, Jackie. On Friday, with Patty. Saturday, with Charles. And Emily and Suki together on Sunday. Each child has his or her own day. The end of the letter. Many years later, after Charles was a grown, after John was a grown man and in the middle of his own struggles of life, he wrote a letter back to his mother. And in his letter he said, Oh, what I'd give for one Thursday night with you, Mom. <laughs> it takes effort to reserve one-on-one -on -one time with your children, but I suspect that the child who gets that kind of personal attention will turn out to be a credit to his or her family. So let's review. The role of the good shepherd and the good parent is sacrificial. The attention of the good shepherd and the good parent is individual. And thirdly, the love of the good shepherd and good parent is unconditional. When Jesus lay down his life, it was to say that God's love had no limit. The love of God, thank God, is not like health insurance. God will not turn us down for any pre-existing condition. His love is unconditional. It does not have a limit to it. You know, we human beings, we tend to live in our own economy. We think that God is only going to love us if we're righteous enough, if we're obedient enough, if we are sweet enough, if we are diligent enough. Then God will love us like you can earn the love of God. We do not earn or deserve God's love, but he gives it to us without condition, unconditionally. Think about your own children, moms. Your children are your children, whether they meet your expectations or not. And you love them, even when they make the same stupid mistakes you made when you were their age. Even when they do those things that make our lives as parents more difficult with all those sleepless nights, we still love them. You know, I, I want to harp on this for a second because I want to remind you, younger people, that even though you know where you are, your parents don't. And even though you know you're okay, they don't. So, Laura and the rest of you, don't forget to check in with your parents and tell them where you are and that you're all right. Right? I just wanted to harp on that for a second. It's a little soapbox of mine. The love of the good shepherd is sacrificial, it is individual, and it is unconditional. The love of the good parent must be likewise. 
I want to conclude with a little anonymous poem about another remarkable mom who might help, help us learn an important lesson about good parenting. The poem is entitled, The Writing on the Wall. You ready for this? It's a little poem. Oh, good one. A weary mom returned from the store, lugging groceries through the kitchen door. Awaiting her arrival was her eight-year-old son, eager to relate what, her, what his younger brother had done. While I was out playing and Dad was on a call, TJ took some crayons and wrote on the wall. It's on the new paper j you just hung in the den. I told him you'd be mad at having to do it again. She let out a moan and furrowed her brow. Where is your little brother right now? She emptied her arms with a purposeful stride. She marched to his closet where he'd chosen to hide. She called out his full name as she entered the room, and he trembled with fear, and he knew that meant doom. For the next ten minutes, she griped and complained about the wallpaper she'd have to rehang. Lamenting the work it would take to repair, she condemned his action and lack of care. The more she scolded, the madder she got. Then she stomped from the room, completely distraught. She glanced in the den to confirm all her fears. When she saw what he'd written, she collapsed in tears. The message she read pierced her soul like a dart. It said, I love mommy, inside of a heart. Well, the wallpaper remained just the way she found it, with a large picture, picture frame she'd hung to surround it. A reminder to her, and indeed to us all, to take the time to read the writing on the wall. Well, the writing on the wall for us today is written by Jesus himself, the Good Shepherd. It says that a good parent's love is sacrificial, it is individual, it is unconditional, and you can't remove it with Coca-Cola. Okay. In the for just a couple of minutes, we'd like to give opportunity for someone to suggest what your mom's favorite hymn is. Is there anyone who knows what your mom's favorite hymn is? And uh, if you want to tell us what it is, we'll sing it with you. All right, Zena was first. She said, how great thou art. That's number 16 in your book. So, how great thou art. Number 16, would you stand up as we sing it? We'll just sing the first verse. Thank you. say what your mom's favorite song is if you know it 
Yeah, Amazing Grace. I heard Amazing Grace. I guess that's what we're going to sing. All right, Cheryl. That's, that's your mom's favorite song. 293, okay? 293. We'll honor Renee and Roxy at the same time. First verse, please. area, we would like to ask our youth and our children to help distribute a, 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 a one stem of flowers to all the moms in the room. So everybody have a seat, would you, just for a couple of minutes. And we're going to sing a song, She Will Be Called Blessed, which is taken from Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 through 31. Okay, so what, would our kids come up and take a stem of flowers and make sure every mom in the room gets a flower to take home. Sing with us, she will be yeah. called blessed. Uh, also, moms, you might want to take a Kleenex and put it at the bottom of that stem because it might have some stem dye in it. You don't want to get it on your clothes, I'm sure of that. Okay, here, but let's, let's do it. Let's start right off singing, okay? Drum, drum, Judy. Go ahead. if she's still with you in the world or remember her fondly from her for her good ministry to you. Did all the moms get a flower? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your help. Kiddos, appreciate that. Let's, uh, let's pray. Precious Lord, our God, how grateful we are that you are an incredibly wonderful designer. 
that you thought up moms, that you created them. And Lord, we ask that you would bless them in their very important, unique mission in the world. God bless them, O oh Lord, everyone, in Jesus' name. God bless you as you go. She